after Russ received his PhD from BYU, he accepted a position as a full-time researcher at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, one of the colleges in the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. While there, he conducted research and developed programs to improve the education of young adults with hearing impairments. In 1978, he took a position at BYU as a researcher and developer in the David O. McKay Institute of Education, where he continued to do research to help those with disabilities. He later became an associate professor in what is now called the Department of Counseling, Psychology, and Special Education, following which he became a professor in instructional psychology and technology. He served as chair of that department, associate dean of the McKay School of Education, associate director of the Faculty Center, and director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. He has published widely on topics related to how humans learn and how teaching can facilitate learning. He particularly enjoys learning other languages. In 1998, Russ was awarded the Corey University Professorship at BYU. Following his service with his wife, Lolly, as president of the South Dakota Rapid City Mission, he served as an Area 70. In 2009, he was called to serve as Sunday School General President. While serving in this calling, he has conducted training uh, sessions and held focus groups in 30 countries to help improve learning and teaching in the church. He and his wife, Lolly, have five children and 21 grandchildren. We're delighted to hear from him after a prayer from Nancy Wentworth. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Alan. Um, thank you, Faculty Center, for having me here today. Um, so good to see so many friends, and grateful for those of you who I have not become acquainted with yet. Hope we can become acquainted during this little session today. Um, they talked to me about, tell, your, tell about your journey. You know, what is your journey as a scholar? And I thought, my journey's been an enjoyable one. I've had a really enjoyable journey. Um, sure, there have been rocks and crevices along the way, but for the most part, I've had a great time. And I started thinking, why have I had such an enjoyable time as a scholar at BYU and in my previous employment? And this quote came to mind from Hugh Nibley, a career is just once around the track. He, he says, you know, a career is something, is an ambition that we shouldn't seek for. A career is something that we shouldn't go after. And of course, we have career days and everything at BYU, and we think careers are what we're after. He's saying, no, 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 a career is not really about it. A career comes from this French word carrière, which really just means once around the track, and then you're done. And there could be no more forlorn ambition than a career. So I thought, I never thought of it as a career. I never published so that I could get continuing status. I never tried to up my teaching scores so that I could get continuing. I, just, I didn't f focus on this this way. I looked at it and said, I want to have a good time doing what I'm doing. I want to help people learn. I want to do inquiry the way I should. So it, it just wasn't like that for me. And a, a, there were moments, you know, when they kept, the university kept discontinuing the organization that I was serving in. This was a pattern. I, I told people, when I'd go to a new organization, I, I would say, I hope this isn't a problem, but every organization I've been in before has been discontinued by the university. <laughs> <laughs> My department was done away with. Really, you know, not that many departments are done away with at the university. My department was done away with. The institute I started working in was done away with. And uh, so through all that, I mean, that did cause some stress, uh, I have to say. I would say, I don't know if I'm going to be here next year because my, my department was just obliterated off the face of the earth. Um, and so one day I was riding home on my bike and I thought, if the university will just give me a little office and a little computer, I like little computers. <laughs> They just give me a little computer and a little office, I'll be okay. I can do what I need to do and be on my way. And they kept doing that, so I kept staying at the university. I love this quote. It's used often, but I just love this. The words on the top are mine. Learning is a sacred privilege, an act of wonder. And then I love this quote from Elder Clark. He who invades the domain of knowledge must approach it as Moses came to the burning bush. He stands on holy ground. 
he would acquire things sacred. What he's saying is all truth, all knowledge, doesn't matter what kind of knowledge this is, it is a sacred thing to do this. We must come to this quest of truth in all regions of human knowledge. Okay, so he's not just saying when we're studying the gospel, he's saying when we're studying whatever question we are asking. So just before this, you're in genetics and, yeah, what's it called, genetics and? Biotechnology. And biotechnology. It's in genetics and biotechnology. When you're studying a question that is burning inside you that you want to solve, it's saying whatever region of human knowledge that is, doesn't matter. Not only you do it in reverence, but with a spirit of worship. In a sense, a spirit of wonder, a spirit of sacredness. Questions, you know, uh, one author one time that I enjoyed said, without perplexity, there is no learning. In other words, until we're perplexed about something, I mean really puzzled by something, we don't really learn. So when you come into a class and somebody says, I'm going to tell you what you're going to learn today, and you're going to be interested in this because you just have to be interested in this because you're here today, and I'm going to tell you you're going to be <laughs> so This is not real learning so much, and we do a lot of it in higher ed. We do tons of this kind of learning in higher ed. We define what you're going to be interested in, but actually the learners hold all the cards. The learners are the ones who know what they're interested in. It's when you have a question that's burning inside you, that's when you come to this sacred ground and ask, and ask for God's help, basically, to help you seek it out. So I want to open this up now just for a minute because I want to learn something from you. Um, we all have examples that we can think of in the gospel where people ask questions. Certainly Joseph began this church that we're all a part of with this activity of asking questions, a faithful question. Alan Wilkins one time, was your talk called Faithful Questions? Faithful Questions. So if you haven't ever read that, I recommend you read Alan's uh, talk of several years ago called Faithful Questions. But think for just a moment, what role does faith play in inquiry? Just talk with someone close by and come up with something really profound and then <laughs> you can share it with us. Just talk for a minute with each other. Okay, if we could wind it up. I would be interested to know what you came up with. What, what thoughts came to you with this question? Yeah, did you have? Yeah, be brave. This is being recorded for posterity. <laughs> I think it has to do with not knowing the answer, but believing there is an answer. That's why we're going after Okay, not knowing the answer, but believing there is an answer. I had a doctoral student one time, and we were doing research in a school. I dropped him off at this school, and he was just collecting the last bit of data on a pretty large project. And he turned back to me before I left, and he said, w w uh, wait a minute, what, what if we don't find anything here? What if we don't find any difference? What if it didn't help? I said, you'll find something. <laughs> I said, just in a sense, have faith. You'll find something. And I said, if we knew the answer, it wouldn't be research. Because a lot of us would like to know what is going to happen at the end of this whole investigative process. What am I going to find? This would make us more comfortable. We don't know. This is what research is about. We don't know the answer. And so that's why we go after it. And it takes a lot of faith, just like you said. Very good. Somebody else? Yeah? Without no. faith, there can be no inquiry. Ah, OK. It's prerequisite to inquiry. It's, it's something that you have to have before. Yeah. It takes faith to even ask the question. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It takes faith to even ask the question. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. I actually see faith as inquiry since life is all about becoming. Yeah. And inquiry is about developing 
knowledge that there are kind of parallel tracks that the act of faith is the act of becoming, which is a form of inquiry. I like it. Very, very nice. Yeah. Clint. I remember my freshman year at BYU, I had a chemistry teacher, and he would start every class by saying, well, should we say a prayer today, or should we rely on our own strength? <laughs> 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 the part of faith is that you realize you don't have to rely on your own insight, your own wisdom. If you have faith in something more intelligent than yourself, then it's an exciting part of the inquiry. The fact that it is unknown is kind of the exciting thing, right? I mean, the fact that we don't know what's going to happen, this is what makes it kind of exciting. And that means we do need God's help throughout this insecurity period that we go through. Yeah? If we don't have the faith, we might not always arrive at the answer. In the case of Joseph, if he didn't have faith right. against all persecution and everything that went on, he never would have been able to reach for the gospel. Yeah, think of with Joseph how that faith helped him ask the question in the beginning, like Norm said, but it also helped him keep going, as you said, when the going got really, really unbelievably tough. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I, I guess that goes along with the idea of not just one question. The inquiry is a huge process. And maybe we have sufficient faith for one answer, then we realize how difficult it will be to get the next and the next and the next, then we give up. We have to have faith throughout that whole process, which is Joseph Smith, he went through that over the course of years and years. So it wasn't just one answer. It was not just one. In fact, the whole DNC is just a series of questions. We had a vice president one time who said that when you get a doctoral degree and you think you've, you hope at that point you've arrived, he said it's like approaching the shore and looking out at this vast ocean that you didn't know existed before because the more knowledge and more uh, inquiry that you experience, the more you see is still yet to be answered. If you look at a any dissertation, any, any piece of research, it ends almost always with additional questions now that need to be answered that you didn't really know about before you started, you know, along this path. Okay, let's keep going for a minute. So now, what role does love play? Because my title was when faith, love, and inquiry meet. So this is a picture of Lorenzo Odoni. I used this um, in the Education of the Heart book that I wrote number of years ago. But this was a young man who got ALD, a very rare disease of the myelin, the, the insulation around the nerves. It's a gradual disintegration of the myelin, which causes all kinds of problems. And in his case, which is about 40% of the cases of ALD, it causes brain uh, dysfunction as well. So the nerves throughout the whole system start to disintegrate, basically, and you lose function and eventually die uh, for many of these cases. But his father, uh, his father's name was Augusto Adone, an uh, Italian name, and he, he said, there's nobody doing research on this. Nobody's asking the questions about how to help my son. Uh, it's such a rare disease that there's not enough money in it for the drug companies to make drugs and for people to do research. And so I'm just going to go and find answers myself because I love my son. And so eventually he became quite expert. He was holding conferences, being invited to conferences to talk about the disease, international meetings. It's a very interesting story. But the story that's the, the part of the story that impresses me is when we love somebody or when we love others enough that that motivates us to ask questions and then we faithfully pursue those questions, we're going to find something that's worthwhile. We're going to find something that's going to bless people. I was with a faculty member one day and he said, um, how do you decide what to ask? You know, and I said, well, it's, I, I've got to figure out how it's going to bless somebody, how it's going to help. And he looked back at me and said, I have never thought of that before. He said, the only way I've thought of scholarship is, what is the journal asking for that I'm trying to publish? What is that journal, what's that line of research that that journal's going after? 
and what are some possible studies that they would be interested in, and so what am I going to publish? It? And, and he says, I've actually never even considered how what I do as a scholar might be of benefit. And I said, start considering it, and it'll, <laughs> it'll make life a lot more fun. It'll make life a lot more exciting to you if you actually think of what benefits can come to others from what you are doing, from the questions you're asking. So, this is kind of the beginning of my journey as a scholar. I mean, I started here doing my doctoral degree, but uh, this is a picture of the Rochester Institute of Technology Library. And I remember early in my time there, I sat inside the library around, it was the education section, so there are all the journals in education, and those of you in education know we've got a lot of journals in education. We don't just have a few. It's not like accounting or whatever that has only a few. We've got a lot of journals and all different sub-disciplines in education, educational technology and special education and adult education and higher education. I mean, we, you can just name 50 of these things. And so we got lots of journals, and I looked around this room, and I was sitting there, and I thought, I want to be in those. I want to be in some of those journals. I want to contribute to the conversation, to the discussion about how people learn and how people teach. And I wasn't in any of them at the moment. And so I started, because I was determined to contribute something to help. So one of the first things I did was, it was a little book called The Tutor Note Taker. For those of you who know deafness, there's one type of support that we all know about, that's the interpreter who stands and signs so that the other person, so the deaf person can understand. But there's another type of support that they need, and that's note taking, because they can't take notes because they're looking at the interpreter, so they can't see their paper, so they can't take notes. They can't write on something and take, you know, and see the interpreter at the same time. So we said, okay, well, let's try and solve this problem. I noticed this little book, this was like 35 years ago, still out there, still helping people. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and so that's an example of where you start something. I was a young scholar and it just kept going. I was on the uh, train the other day going up Salt Lake and this fellow was in deafness and he says, oh yeah, I know about that. I said, we did that way back at NTID. He says, I know about that because we still use that. It's one of the prime support service kinds of things that we have is note-taking and tutoring. So then we also, right then, I thought, well, let's teach deaf people how to take notes themselves and give them some kind of line guide so that their pen doesn't write over your writing. Does that make sense? And so this was with, it was a plexiglass line guide. That has not survived. <laughs> that didn't survive more than about a year or two or whatever. The dean at the institute where I was working was just so excited about it. He would take it around and show it to everybody. He said, look at this. This is just such a great thing. But you know, ideas go and ideas come and some mature and some don't. And we just keep asking and trying and seeing what we can find that works. When I came to the McKay Institute in 1943, not really. Um, it seems a long time ago. Um, so I started doing reverse role tutoring, we called it. So I said, let's take kids with disabilities, and instead of having them always be the recipient of tutoring, let's have them be the tutors. So we had them tutor kids without disabilities. So sometimes we had, does this make sense? You say, well, how could that happen? How could it? So sometimes we had them teach sign language. So we would teach sign language to kids with retardation or kids with behavior disorders, and then we'd have them tutor, sometimes we'd have them tutor kids in the gifted class. We kind of just flip the tables on people. And so instead of this gifted kid being all, all the time the smart kid and helping the kid that can't do anything, we said, why don't we flip that around and see what happens? See what happens with socialization? See what happens with the way that they interact with each other, how they appreciate each other as kids? Lots of fun stuff here. I mean, I, I had just had a total blast doing all this. Um, and and that, again, that's still out there and, and still helps people. Symbol processor, we, we, this was one of the first early communication boards. So uh, these things don't exist now, but it's about this big. It's like a giant iPad. And so if, if you're aware of people with severe disabilities, they have to have communication boards because they can't talk, so they point to things. But what we said was, it would be nice for some of them to be able to put that into print. 
because no communication board at that time, of course, there wasn't, this was when computers were just coming in, and so nobody could print anything from that. So we, had, we helped these kids who had almost no communication be able to print. And of course, that had a short half-life uh, because technology changed and changed and changed, but it still kind of was a forerunner to a lot of electronic communication boards that are, that are now used. We got the McKay School, and so kind of what I'm trying to do is paint a picture of how broad, in a sense, some of the questions I asked was. It, most educators stay in a kind of narrow field, narrow discipline, a focus on their scholarship, but when I got to McKay, uh, the McKay School of Education, um, I was in a conversation with the vice president one day, and he said, well, tell me, do you, how do you feel about the five-year teacher education program, that we should take five years instead of four to prepare teachers? And I said, I don't know. I have no idea. And I'd been in instructional psychology and technology. This was not a question instructional psychology and technology asks. So I really didn't know how I felt about this. So I marched right back to the McKay School and I said, I don't want to have to say to a vice president that I have no idea how I feel about something because I don't have any knowledge about it. So we went out and did a large survey, a nationwide survey, published articles in, in teacher education about um, teacher education programs, basically. And then the BOA Public School Partnership was in its inception at that point. We did a lot of work on that. Uh, international work, did a lot of stuff in, with Europe and with China. And then I wrote this, this book, The Education of the Heart, which I hope is, is going to be a free ebook pretty soon. Um, you like that picture? <laughs> when I joined the Faculty Center, this is how the faculty looked at BYU. <laughs> So I was part of the Faculty Center for about four years, working with Dave Whetton and others and Jane and had a great time there. And then I started thinking about faculty development, which I hadn't really thought of much before because we were thinking about teacher education, working with disabilities. But when this position came, I thought, okay, I gotta learn more about faculty development. So I started asking questions about that and doing some writing on adult learning and faculty development. And then I was in IPNT for a brief period before we went on a mission and then CTL when we came back did quite a bit with uh, blended learning, faculty development again, and then most recently helping with the development of learning suite for the university. I thought I'd put this in because as a mission president, I had a very um, rich learning experience, really. You know, here we had 421 total missionaries over that period of time, not at once, but total of 421, and you learn something from every missionary. And when we got home, my wife and I said, you know, we, we need to write something to kind of encapsulate what we learned during that time. And that was when we wrote Choose to Learn, just a little book that talks about, um, it's really aimed at teachers, but it really just helps us understand the importance of helping people have autonomy and power to choose in the learning process. Uh, yeah, this is our t-shirt. We, we had a little party last night and one of the 70s said, could I get a t-shirt like that? I said, they're gonna go on sale at the bookstore very soon. <laughs> Sunday School rocks, <laughs> world tour. Um, <clears throat> so for the last almost five years, I've been in this calling of Sunday School. Had amazing experiences. Um, which are way too numerous. I, I thought the other day, I thought, I've been in this for 35 years, and I've kind of got one minute for each year. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of what you're getting. <laughs> um, during this time of Sunday school, the new youth curriculum, Come Follow Me, has emerged and been distributed in 23 languages. The new adult curriculum, hopefully, will come out next year. Uh, that's what we hope. Um, it's not totally decided yet, but it'll come out either in 2015 or 2016. This will be a new curriculum for priesthood meeting, Relief Society, and Sunday School. So all adult classes will be more patterned after what we're doing with Come Follow Me. Again, much more focus on the autonomy of the learner, much more focus on helping teachers um, have the room and space to choose more about what they're teaching rather than be scripted totally, as we've often had in the past. So that's that. At times in my career, I felt like I've gone so many different directions all at once. I mean, I've just been all over the map. And I thought, actually, maybe I haven't. 
Maybe I've only ever asked just one question. This is my question, and it's kind of a question I still ask all the time, and I keep asking it. How can we help improve human learning? And this is a question, I think. Just talk with each other for a minute about why this is worth thinking about. In other words, why, why is it important to become a better learner? Why? Just talk for a moment about that. Okay, maybe we could come back. As a teacher, I have to confess, sometimes I just feel like coming and giving a little question that's worth thinking about and then leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and letting all of you just figure out this thing and talk about it until you come up with something. Um, I'd love to hear you talk. Anyway, what, what, um, what did you come up with? Yeah. Well, um, I was just thinking that, first of all, to be a better learner, maybe that's a more efficient learner. You can be able to utilize the information that you um, can acquire and synthesize. But maybe can you give us better questions? And then maybe get a uh, better application for them. Okay, so how can I ask better questions, yeah, and better applications for them? Yeah, that's good. Who else? Yeah. I was just thinking of why we're here, as in like on Earth, why we're here, and it's really to learn and you know, how much time we spend trying to become better athletes or better musicians or better writers when our main focus is to learn. And that should be our main hobby here on Earth. So to become the best learner we can be will be really powerful for us. Mm. Put that on your refrigerator. <laughs> That's good. It's really good. Why are we here? It's all, that, it's all this life is, really. We're just here to learn. I always call it learning our way back home. We're trying to learn our way back home to the Lord. That's why we're here. Yeah. I like it. Let's, be, let's all become a better becomer. Yeah. Yeah. Elder Oaks, of course, has taught about this, the knowing, doing, and becoming. And in higher ed, we shortchange the doing oftentimes. We long change the knowing. So we do a lot of stuff with knowledge and facts and intellectual kinds of knowledge and not sometimes as much as we need to with what are we doing to practice this thing, to get it inside us so we can become, as you say. Someone else has something. Yeah, Norm? So I have a question. Yeah. What do you mean by better learner? OK. Is that, is, that a, is that a quantitative, or is it a qualitative? Is it an attitude? Is it a characteristic? I wasn't even sure what a better learner would be. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. So, I'm the right, you're asking me the question. I will throw it right back and say, uh, these, this is a good thing to think about. And we'll leave it for us all to think about what we mean by better learner. For me, um, I've always said learning is just another form of repentance. We're giving up an old way of thinking or being and trading it in for a new one. And so we become better at this process of getting rid of something that is not productive, not true, not good, not wholesome, whatever, and trade it in for the good. I don't know if you've ever read this book. I, a student actually referred this to me. It was somebody I met on the train. It's the most interesting encounter, really. Very interesting encounter with this. He's just a graduate of BYU. 
but a recent graduate, and started talking. Anyway, he, got, he said, you ought to read the power, of, the power of Habit. How many have read The Power of Habit? It's, it's out there, I mean, not nobody. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's, it's worth taking a look at, The Power of Habit. I mean, it's, it's quite behavioristic in the beginning, but then it gets a little less behavioristic as it goes along. <laughs> and um, this whole thing of saying, if we want to become good at something, we have got to practice it over and over again. It's got to get inside us. It's got to get automatic. Sometimes in instructional design, we call it you know, automaticity. We get it right down. So we don't have to think about it. When you put the clutch in on your car, you don't have to think about that. It's just automatic because you've done it so many times. This power of habit thing, if we have habits that are not good, not productive, not wholesome, then we're in trouble, big trouble. And how do we trade those habits in for habits that are productive, wholesome, good? Now we're on to something. So, uh, but I'll let you think about what does it mean to be a better learner. Um, you know, there are people, I mean, we have Stephen Jones back here who has watched a lot of musicians over his career do a lot of improving. And some are probably better learners than others, is that right? They're more able to listen, to imitate, to magnify, whatever skill they're learning. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is really interesting to think about, Norm, so I'm glad you brought it up. So, I want to show this other thing first. I, I can't wait to show you this. This is Sage Kotzenberg. So some of you may have seen Sage Kotzenberg. He's a snowboarder, um, and he got the gold medal in snowboarding. So he, here's, here is Sage doing his jump. So he takes off and does a fairly simple thing. And then he gets ready for the big jump. Watch this. Now we look at that and we say, yeah, we just see this every day at the Olympics. It's really great. Um, watch this again. When they interviewed him, he said, you know, I had never done that trick before in my life. <laughs> now think of this. This is what is, this, this got me. He's in the competition, the medal is on the line, and he's going to try something he has never attempted before in his life. Think of that. Does that take a little faith? I mean, I think, I, I think so, you know. <laughs> Uh, maybe you say he's crazy, you know. <laughs> when you hear people say they're coming down the slalom thing and he's skiing very cautiously, he's being very careful, and so, oh, he's just lost a half a second, oh. And so, but in this, he's doing something he'd never done before in his life. I kept thinking about this. This is a skill, obviously. We talk about line upon line, precept upon precept, and I thought, uh, we can also talk about skill upon skill, because do we think that this trick was totally dramatically different from anything he'd ever tried? No. He built upon what he had done before. He was adding something that he had never added before. And so this is how we learn, in a sense. We don't just all of a sudden, I can't just say, you know, to Richard Swan, I just know that you can be a great concert pianist if you just go sit down at that piano right now and just do it. <laughs> you know? No, you can't do that, and you can't be a great snowboarder and just one fell swoop. No, you've got to keep practicing, getting feedback, practicing, getting this habit inside you so that your body just knows what to do. And that's not just with, you know, motor skill type things. It's with everything. And so, when you're learning a foreign language, the same thing. You can build on skills that you have developed so that you can become, Norm, a better learner, a more able learner, more able to understand, to produce, to perform what you want to do. And so that's why this, this Sage Kostenberg kind of got me. I, I thought, what inside him said to himself, okay, I'm going to try something I have never tried before. Now, so here's my question to you, and this is how we're going to end, and then you can ask questions in however you want. But um, when I go out and train, I'm trying to help people improve their learning and teaching. So if, 
if I ask you these questions, and these are questions that people have a hard time answering, a really hard time answering. I have been in groups where I say, what are you doing to become a better teacher? And the person says, oh, that reminds me of a principle in teaching no greater call. It's about that. And I said, wait a minute. No, I say, what are you doing? You yourself, what are you doing? And this is something I've been asking myself. And so, because I thought, how can I be going out there trying to help people improve their learning and teaching if I'm not doing it myself, if I'm not trying myself? What am I doing? Like Sage, what am I trying that I've never tried before? Because how can we improve if we don't try something new? We've got to try something that we've never tried before, or how can we get better? We can't get better if we just keep doing the same old, same old thing. So it's like, well, then what am I doing to improve my ability to learn? And what am I doing to improve my ability to teach? So this is the last thing. If you just want to think about that, talk about it with whoever. Um, and then I would like to hear if, if you're doing something, you know? When we talk to faculty and, and see how fac when faculty really make improvements, they are doing new things they have not done before. They're trying new ways to get better. And if they're not trying new ways, they're not getting better. And they're dissatisfied, frustrated, disappointed in their own performance. So I want to see what, what, but we're all learners and teachers. We don't have to be faculty. We're, every student is a learner and teacher. So think, would you think about this for a minute? Can you do that? Is that okay? Do that. Just a minute. Let me, if I could, let me just hear a few uh, ideas of what you've got, and then you can ask any questions you want, and we'll be out of here. Yeah. Going through senior year classes, I've been surprised at how much I've had to continue to change up and develop my studying techniques. What I've done this semester is for some of my classes made a study protocol, just uh, written down in, uh, on my computer what I do and what order to do it. And if I'm short on time, what's the most important to do for a given class? Um, yeah. And I love my computer flashcard program. And I've been trying to improve the efficiency in using that. So trying to figure out better efficient ways to, to take information in and to keep it in. Fabulous. It's great. By the way, if you look at seniors and you look at freshmen, they are so different in how they go at in general, I'm saying. They're just so very different. They become better learners as they go along, like, like you're doing. This is great. OK? Yeah? Um, I'm a student teaching in a special ed classroom right now. Oh. And uh, there's just a lot of frustration on my part because it's like I'm not, I'm not being as I'm supposed to be. Right. Good. This is good. We can all become better becomers, and we can love the discomfort of, be of becoming better becomers. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, I, try to, I try to give myself settling time. Um, sometimes I, I personally can get really caught up in trying to do more and read more and, and uh, take more in. One of the things we know about when courses are taught quickly versus when they're spaced is this gestation time for learning is very helpful. You can tell, for example, when you're learning a language, there has to be some time. You can't just do it. There has to be time to kind of let your ear adjust, really, and let your brain adjust to everything that you're trying to master. Yeah. OK, yeah. And then let's. Let's go, let's go back to the other microphone, because this one's not, this one doesn't work really well. So, responding to your question, what to do to become a better learner and teacher, I think yeah. 
can just ask yourself the question over and over again, what can I do differently? How can I change? Yeah. What tweaks or radical yeah. differences can I make to make my life better? And then for teaching, instead of being self-focused, you're learner-focused. What, can, what changes can I make to better the lives of my learners? Mm. Excellent. Great. Taylor. I try to give myself uh, experiences that are outside my normal situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I try to have lunch with people who come from different fields and perspectives and ask them about what they're working on and why that motivates them. And I try to go to places. I spend my life in the university setting. I actually try to get out sometimes to go to manufacturing locations and learn about the processes there, or meet with farmers or people who are into race cars. I mean, you don't find race cars here on campus typically. So <laughs> people very focused in the university setting that we have somehow have a lock on all knowledge, all truth, and all ways of knowing. And there's a whole world out there in addition to what's going on at the university where people are learning, doing, and being. And we need to be open to those worlds. One of the, one of the things that hits me is, you know, Taylor's quite a connector. Uh, he connects with lots of people not just on campus, but off, as he said. We, we exercise, my wife and I, every morning. There's this one fellow that we can be right across the whole gym, and he'll say, Brother Osgoth, <laughs> he connects. And sometimes I'll be doing some exercise, and he'll just come up, and he says, I've got a question. How do you feel about this, and what about that? And this is a little bit like Taylor. He, he just goes out and asks and finds, he learns from people. That's one way that we can all improve our learning is by genuinely be interested, you know, we can genuinely be interested in what others are thinking, what others are feeling, how they're going about life, yeah. Do you have any questions at all, broadly, do you want to ask about anything we've said? Steve? I would like to have you uh, think for us, given especially the last five years of your experience, about a minute ago, you were talking about learning as, as a form of repentance, shedding the old idea for right. a, a new understanding, and therefore hopefully a new behavior. Right. Uh, I came late, so you might have covered this, and if so, you can tell me. But uh, what's the relationship between learning and the atonement? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is a big question. <laughs> yeah. So. We know that the atonement, there, at least there are two primary strands here in the strengthening and the redemptive power. You think about the relationship of learning to the strengthening power, obviously this becomes quite clear in focus. We become stronger as we learn more. We had a vice president one time who said, ignorance is our greatest enemy. Not knowing, not understanding is our greatest enemy. When you look at how people sometimes, and I will say, destroy themselves, it is sometimes because of lack of knowledge and not knowing what they should be doing. Sometimes it's because of lack of will. They know what they should do and don't do it. But sometimes it's lack of knowledge. It's a disaster. And so this learning process certainly works hand in hand with the atonement. But the powerful thing, I mean, that you're causing me to think about right now is when we do our part, you know, after all you can do, in a sense, then the Lord can magnify us to be able to do what we really want to do, but had not yet been able to do without the power of the atonement helping us to do it. That is tremendously powerful. The redemptive power, then, we could talk about for a long time, about learning and redemption, and how we learn from our mistakes, how we learn from feeling forgiven, how we learn from forgiving others. All of these things go hand in hand. What a beautiful question, Stephen. Yeah. Steve. Well, do you mind if I follow up just a little bit? On no, go ahead. Set me straight. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Not at all. But um, I was thinking in terms of the tone of if life on earth is this, this sort of spiritual journey to, uh, mm-hmm. to I mean, he and Hitler talked about that, right? Right. The purpose of the earth is to provide the room and board while we're here at school, kind of a thing. Yes. And, uh, so, I mean, the atonement is kind of what makes all that possible. Because we're exactly. Gonna off, I mean, we're going to be making mistakes all over the place. And we're going to be using right. it daily, hourly. Right. As we, as we look toward our past, it's a cleansing. As we look toward the future, it's strengthening and enabling. And the present, it voids. Yeah. You know. 
and you said something that connects that with something that Dylan used to say. Remember our old colleague Dylan? Yes. yes. He, in, his, in one of his classes, he used to talk about um, the savior's two law, the, the two laws of learning, and then when you get in, because you know behaviors, we're always talking about laws of learning, right? And when you got into the discussion, you realized what he was talking about was the savior's laws of learning, which are basically love God and love neighbor. And he was saying that if you if that's where your heart is at bottom, then the rest of it just follows out from that, right? You have the atonement there, and you have all this hard work, but you have the savior accelerating your efforts, magnifying what you could do like at every turn. It makes a huge Thank difference. Thank you, Steve. That's so good. Um, it's, it's kind of like this. We, those two commandments, love God and love neighbor, these are things that do require learning, in a sense. We learn to come closer to God. We learn to get along with our neighbor. We learn to appreciate our neighbor in all of our neighbor's differences and things that we don't understand. We learn how to be in the world with each other. It's yeah, this is, this is very good. Okay, do we have to end? We gotta end, right? Five minutes. We have five minutes, five more minutes? Okay. I don't ever wanna go over. Let me just tell you, I never go over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Perhaps as you're uh, in your position in the church uh, Sunday school, we can figure out a way to politely critique teachers <laughs> and give them the needed feedback that they need. Uh, I've, sat, I've sat now in Sunday school classes for over 60 years, many of them very painful, because <laughs> the teachers, nobody's polite enough or has the finesse to suggest how they can improve. And so we go through this, right. this, this torture every week. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is a way to correct it, but I will suggest or submit that critiquing is not the way. So that's just my feeling. So my feeling is that, in other words, even, when, even in teacher ed, you know, going into somebody and saying, you know what, you've just given all your guts to this teaching thing, and let me tell you where you went wrong. <laughs> you know, this doesn't help too much to people. Um, they're kind of, they are becoming, they're trying to become better. So there are ways to help this. And one of my favorite things is, let us look for the good. Let us look for the good things that are happening and magnify those good things so that they do more of those good things. I'll give you one example. I was in a class, it was a 14-year-old class. The uh, teacher was a return, or was a former stake president and wonderful, wonderful teacher. But in the beginning, he said he had him looking in the topical guide about, he had him looking for the word atonement, finding a favorite scripture, talking about that scripture. It was good. It was really good. The kids were doing great things. And then he said, Oop, cl oh, close, we've, I've got a lot of stuff to read to you here. I've got to get through all this stuff. And he started reading out of the manual to them, and it was not good. And the kids went crazy on him. And... Afterwards, he said, you got to tell me, how do I teach 14-year-olds? And I said, you know what you did in the beginning of the class? Do more of that. Get those kids working, doing, thinking, and you're going to have a great time with 14-year-olds. So that was my way. You might have called that critiquing, but I wasn't critiquing him. I was finding the good and trying to magnify it. If we do that with teaching, things will get better. If we try and point out faults, we're, we're in trouble, usually, and in the church. I had, when I first became Sunday school president, somebody wrote and said, you ought to do it like this other club I was a part of. You just be in the evaluation and you just say, you're a four on this and a two on that, you're terrible at this, and, and then fire them if they're not good. <laughs> you say, well, actually, this is the kingdom of God. We don't fire people. <laughs> We just don't do that, you know? So we try and help people. And so there are all kinds of, everyone's frustrated with how to help people become better, but this is my approach. Look for the good, magnify it, have it replace the ineffective thing. Somebody else had one, yes? Uh, back by Norm, yeah. Sue, oh, hi. 
Yeah, I just don't see you often enough. That is so great. So many friends here. I can't believe it. It's amazing that friends would, you know, come to hear this. <laughs> yeah. One of the reasons I love the big screen with the question mark and the question about how to become a better learner is because I think the way to help our teachers is to take the responsibility to be better learners. Great. I have found the best great. way to help my teachers succeed is to keep my commitment to learn from them. Fabulous. And yeah. Just couldn't agree more, Sue. Just marvelous. Are we there? We are there. So let me just end by saying thank you for being with us and for contributing all that you've contributed. And um, just want to tell you what a great experience it is just to be here. Just to be at, you know, this university is a unique experience. It is very unique. Uh, I walk along the sidewalk sometimes now because I just retired, and people say, oh, do you miss it? Of course I miss it. You know, I, I don't miss, what I, what I feel like in a sense is um, I, I still feel a part of it. I'll always, always feel a part of it. I'm never gonna graduate. I told my kids one day, I never graduated. I'm just a student, I'm just a learner. I'm always a learner, will always be a learner. Uh, I still feel that way. I, that's why I wanted to learn from you, and I learned some wonderful things from you. So my prayer is that as we leave, we will continue to try and think, how can I be a better learner? How can I be a better teacher? How can I help others do the same? In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.